Oop, you're on mute. Oh. Oh. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us to learn more about financial aid and the admissions process here at UNC Greensboro. My name is Yubisela Aranda Sandoval. I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement as an Assistant Director, and it is my pleasure to serve as your moderator for tonight's panel discussion. As many of you have noticed, UNCG Chance has gone virtual this year. And for the past three years, UNCG Chance has been providing an immersive six-day summer experience for Latinx rising high school juniors and seniors. During their time on campus, students were able to participate in a variety of experiences that gave them a glimpse of life as a UNCG student. They engaged with a host of university professors, current students, alumni, and staff to forge a network of meaningful connections focused on academic success and personal growth. Their program the program was created to encourage Latinx students to attend college by increasing their awareness of higher education and showing that it is well within their reach. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has caused us to pause our face-to-face -face camp experience and find a safe way to engage the students who are seeking information about how they can too reach their goal of attending and completing college. Through technology and dedication, we have brought together our faculty, staff, students, and alumni to share with students across our state and beyond. Every student can find their chance here at UNC Greensboro. Again, welcome. Let's begin our presentations with introductions, shall we? Let's uh, begin with our panelists. Please tell us your name, position, and a fun fact about yourself. Let's begin with Jasmine. Hey everyone, my name is Jasmine Velasquez. I work in the admissions office as an admissions counselor. And a fun fact is that I actually ran track in college. Thank you, Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Chris Ratliff. I work in the financial aid office. Uh, fun fact about me is that um, I still play baseball. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Katia? Hello, everyone. My name is Katia Castellon, and I'm an Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions. And, uh, you know, when you talk about fun facts, it's hard for me to come up with one, you know. Um, I like to work and, um, in the garden a lot. I don't know if that's fun or not. You know, it's more like uh, <laughs> um, just to um, decompress a little. That's a fun fact. Um, that is very much a decompressing activity. So I would agree with you there. So <laughs> Margarita. Hey, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Margarita. Oh, by the way, Katia has the most beautiful garden that I never see. Believe me. She is awesome. Uh, and my name is Margarita Carcaro, and I work with the uh, um, admission office. Uh, I'm an assistant director and uh, also a counselor, admission counselor. And the fact, the fun, fun fact about me is I have a lot, <laughs> but one is <laughs> that I love to put, um, no, that is not, it's, it's dangerous. Um, I love to dance, I dance Mexican folklore and tango. That's awesome. Um, let's see, Hema. Hey everyone, my name is Hema Herrera and I am currently a graduate student at UNC Greensboro under the Student Affairs Program. And the fun fact, I guess mine will be more so interesting slash unique. I don't like bacon, so. Yeah, <laughs> that is interesting because a lot of people like bacon. I mean, it's all right. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we have lost a couple of our panelists. Um, our, there's a storm coming through and um, we've had some technical difficulties with uh, power uh, shortages. So bear with us as they are going to join us here shortly. Um, but we want to go ahead and um, start with with our presentation um 
We will begin shortly with a video. As we get that going, I want to let you uh, know that we are doing a question and answer and you can post your questions and comments and, and they will be answered towards the end of the presentation. So um, please put your comments in, uh, in the post or in the, um, in the chat box and we will get to them as soon as uh, the presentation is over. Let's go ahead and get started. This, this is a remarkable place a place steeped in history, where trails have been blazed, discoveries have been made, and lives have been changed forever. This is a place that holds questions and answers, problems and solutions. It's a place to tap into your creativity, curiosity, and ambition. This is a place to pursue what makes you, you. Here you'll be challenged and cheered. And you'll join a tradition of change makers. This is a place you'll miss when you leave. around and picture yourself here at this unique time in this remarkable place you'll be amazed at what you find welcome to unc greensboro find your way here That was an awesome presentation. I love that video because it shows a true spirit of what our alma mater, I am an alumna. So it, it shows our beautiful campus. So I, I just love to see that video every time they play it. Um, Jasmine, let's begin with you. Yes, hello everyone again. I am a freshman admissions counselor. Um, it's currently storming outside. So I really hope the internet stays right now. So. Hopefully we'll be good. But as you saw in the video, unique UNCG is very unique. It's a very special place here. And our main thing, our main tagline is that we hope you find your way here and we hope you find your place here. Um, it's something that's very important to us. And if you can go to the next slide. So as you can see, we hope you find your place here at UNCG. It's very special and we have a lot of things that are available to you at UNCG. And next slide. So as you can see, we have a lot of clubs on campus. So one of our main goals for everyone who comes to UNCG is to really get involved. And a really great way to get involved is getting involved in a club on campus. So we have over 250 clubs on campus. So as you can see, there's different types of clubs as well. And if say you found didn't find something that you are interested in, you can even make your own club, which is really awesome. If you found three friends and a faculty member, you can create your own club. So there's anything from sports, intramural clubs to religious based clubs to napping clubs. Um, so there's all sorts of different things that you can do here at UNCG. And this is just a really great way to meet people that are interested in the same thing as you. So here at UNCG, we really hope you can get involved in something like this. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we also have a lot of different ways for you to just enjoy yourself outside of the classroom. Um, so as you can see, this is the Kaplan Wellness Center. This is our gym on campus. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, it was built in 2016, so it's very, very new. 
Everything is super new. You can even connect um, your Netflix account to a treadmill, which is really fun. And um, if you actually stopped running, it stops playing the Netflix show. Um, so it kind of is an incentive, but there's all sorts of things that they offer outside of just the Kaplan Center. You can even sign up for outdoor activities like backpacking, hiking, kayaking. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can do. They even have movie nights in the pool. So everyone sits in the pool um, and watches a movie on this big screen. So there's all sorts of things that you can get involved. Um, and this is just a way for you to enjoy yourself um, outside of school. Of course, academics is the most important, but there are other things that you can do on campus. And another huge thing, UNCG is very diverse. And that's something that we pride ourselves on here at UNCG. As you can see, we have students that come from over 43 different states and 62 countries. So there are people from all over. And I think that's something that's really important is that there is a place for everyone. Um, one of our tour guides, one of our Spartan guides actually, um, he always explained that when he was coming to UNCG that he felt like he was already from a pretty diverse high school, but he really didn't realize until he came to UNCG that when he was in his classrooms and he was meeting students from Spain and from other countries, he was like, wow, you know, here it's really diverse. I'm meeting all these people from all over the world. Um, so that's just a, a good example to show you that in your classes, you'll see people and you'll meet people, um, not just from the United States, but from outside of the United States, which is a really awesome thing. And if you go to the next slide. And here is just a picture. We do have what's called our International Festival. We have so many different events that we hold during the school year um, through um, the Multicultural Center here on campus. So the Office um, of Multicultural um, Leadership has so many different events that they hold. Um, they have the MLK celebration, um, the Tunnel of Oppression. Um, they have all sorts of things. And of course, the International Festival, which I think is a lot of people's favorites. Um, so there's all sorts of booths over campus. Um, you can play different games. You can try different food and just learn about other cultures that you might not be um, familiar with, which I think is really awesome. People even dress in their cultural attire. So it's a really fun day. And I mean, look at those smiling faces. You can't tell me that doesn't look fun. So there's a lot of ways to get involved here at UNCG. Um, and that's a huge reason of why. We hope you come and experience UNCG in the future because we here at UNCG think it is a very special place. And in the next slide. And of course, we know the reason that you're here is for academics. That is the most important thing. Um, we know there are a lot of majors to choose from, um, which can be daunting, but don't worry. We have a lot of ways that you can look into each of the majors, look at summaries and jobs that you can go into. Um, so actually on our website, we have all of the different majors with summaries of each of them. Um, so I definitely recommend that you take time after this to go look at those. We also have what's called major maps um, that are on the website as well. And those are really, really helpful um, just to look and to see what sort of jobs you can go into after you graduate. And it's a really helpful guide if you're just not sure what you want to study, which is completely normal. Um, we even have um, an undecided major and it's called exploratory. So you get to take courses your freshman year and um, in different aspects. So you can take different classes to kind of see what, is, what you're interested in. And it's a really great way for students who just really aren't sure yet. And that's perfectly fine. Um, and a lot of students end up finding what they want to go into by their sophomore year. So it's a really great way. Also, something that I like to um, point out is that we do have an average class size of 25 students. So this makes it really easy to connect with your professors. Um, as you can see here, professors really take time to meet with their students. They actually have what are called office hours. So they take time. Um, they're actually required to have office hours. So you can go into their office, ask them questions, which 
is really helpful and you can even make really great connections with your professors. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get involved, um, not just at the school, but in your specific majors and with faculty members that um, if we didn't have that average class size of 25, you might not be able to do. Um, so it makes it really great that having those smaller class sizes that you can get involved. Um, and then of course, um, admissions on the next slide. So just some different steps on the admissions process, which of course the most important thing um, before you come to school. So our application is available on our website. Um, as you can see at the bottom, that's the link on how you can apply. It's very, very easy once you get to our website, but there's also a few different places that you can apply. So um, if you are familiar with the Common App, the Common App is a place where you can go and apply for multiple schools at one time. So maybe you're interested in a few other schools, it might have the application on there too. It kind of makes it easier to go through all your applications rather than going to um, schools different websites. So that's another place that you can apply. And then you can also apply on CFNC. Um, so three different ways that you can apply, but no matter how you apply, we have what's called a Spartan Link account and that's created. And even if you aren't applying this year, maybe you're a freshman, sophomore, maybe you're a junior, um, you can actually create what's called a prospect account. Um, and in doing that, you just get different emails from us um, about different events going on. Maybe you wanna do a virtual tour. You can sign up to do that and that's all through Spartan Link. So then maybe you're a sophomore, you create a prospect account. By the time you're a senior, you already have that account created. And once you submit your application, you can see that in there. So it's a really great way to see everything in front of you. If you have to send in certain transcripts, um, if you have to send in uh, you know, certain documents that you need, it will all pop up in there in your to-do list. So it's a really great way to see everything in front of you, as well as if you have to pay an application fee. It is a $65 application fee, but we do accept fee waivers. So we accept the NACAC, NAC, AC fee waiver, the SAT fee waiver, and the ACT fee waiver. So don't feel like if that's, you know, you look at that and it does seem expensive, you can send in one of those waivers to waive that application fee. So just keep that in mind for the future. And for spring 2021 and fall 2021, it is test optional. We have a one year um, free waiver, so you don't have to send in test scores. Um, so this is a really good opportunity to work on other parts of your, excuse me, other parts of your application. So as you can see at the bottom, we do have an essay portion for our fall freshman students. I highly, highly recommend that you do the essay. It will really help you out. It will really help your application out because when you apply, the only thing I'll be able to see is your GPA. And you know, sometimes your GPA just doesn't show who you are as a person, as an applicant. So it's really important that you get that essay out there. We also have a section on the application that talks about um, activities. So if you, you know, work outside of school, even if you take care of family members, um, if you are in sports, if you're in clubs at school, put that on there because it will really help us make a decision and show who you are as a person. So those are just some extra things um, when you apply that you can keep in mind. Um, we're here to help you. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to the admissions office, no matter what grade you're in, we'll be here to help and assist you throughout your process. Thank you, Jasmine. That was very helpful information. Um, you mentioned student orgs. Yes, you know, students can create um, their own, own organization if they'd like to, um, if nothing fits their needs that's already uh, available. And IFAST, yes, it's got to be one of the most well-attended events in our whole campus. And even people from our outside community know about it and come and join. So I really love that event and the experience that it brings to not just the campus community, but also the greater um, Greensboro community as well. And 
you are also right about professors. Professors are so very reachable. You can connect with them and you can ask them questions. Um, I remember our, my professors were always, you know, an email away. Um, so that is something that I do. I did enjoy as a student uh, being able to contact my professor and then uh, responding back in a timely manner. So you hit on great um, experiences that you would have here as a UNCG student. Um, Chris, tell us about financial aid. Yeah, it's not a very fun subject to talk about, um, but a very necessary mm -hmm. subject to talk about. And I do want to say thank you very much all for joining us tonight. And we will open up here at the end for some question and answers. Um, so if, if you have a question, definitely ask it in the in, in the Facebook Live there, and we'll get to it in just a little bit. So I want to go over a couple of pointers um, about financial aid and how to pay your bill. As I said, my name is uh, Dr. Chris Ratliff. I'm my assistant director for the financial aid office here. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, how do you pay for college? Um, about 80% of our students complete a free application for federal student aid, or you hear us call it a FAFSA. Um, for you seniors, you will file your FAFSA here pretty soon. Um, for the 2021-2022 year, which will be fall next year, your FAFSA becomes available on August, uh, October 1st of 2020. That's right, that's this October. That's just right around the corner here. So get your information together. Um, some advice for any of this is earlier is always better. So our priority deadline, meaning we have the most money between October and December 1st. So if you can get your information together then and get it submitted between October 1st and December 1st, we can make sure we can have you ready to go for the fall that upcoming August. Um, so what you'll need to do, to do is it's a federal website and you can find this in various different places on how to get to FAFSA. Please remember the first F in FAFSA is free. There's no need to pay anybody to do this application, okay? It's a free application. It'll walk you step by step through it. What you'll need to know is your parents, 2019 tax income information, if they filed and if they didn't file, your 2019 tax information, if you filed or not, or you didn't file, and then who is in your household? Are your parents married, living together? Who's living in your household and who also attends college? Um, the FAFSA is based on your US residency and not your parents. So if your parents do not have a, a citizenship status here in the United States, that doesn't matter. You still complete the FAFSA. Um, it'll ask them for their social security number. Um, and if they do not have a social security number, you will type all zeros for that social security number. That's the way you tell FAFSA that that they don't have a social. Don't put your tax ID number in there. Only use the zeros if they don't have a social. And remember that the financial aid to get, receive federal financial aid is based on the student's residence, US residency status or, or citizenship here. Um, as I said before, it's 100% free. So make sure you don't pay anybody to do this. Um, you can walk your steps through it. A lot of times high schools will have FAFSA night where you can bring your information and different people will be there to help you uh, complete your FAFSA and complete it accurately. And for UNCG in most schools, you have to be admitted into the school to know how much financial aid we can offer for the upcoming semesters. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I wanna go over some things that financial aid does offer. Uh, number one thing, everyone who fills out a FAFSA is gonna be offered loans. If your parents make zero money or if they make a million dollars, you're going to be offered loans. So that's that's part of the application there that you can use to help pay your bill. These loans will be in the student's name, meaning you, the student, will be responsible for these loans. There's also parent loans, but that's a separate thing other than the FAFSA. Uh, remember, loan is anytime you see loan attached to any anything on your financial aid awards, it means you have to pay it back. And if you, as I said, if you complete the FAFSA, you also will be offered these loans. And if you have to pay it back, it would, if you have to pay it back, there there's stipulations that where, you know, you start to go in repayment six months after graduation, and then you can set up payments arrangement through your uh, loan provider. Okay, next slide. What everybody wants are grants and scholarships. That's the free aid. This is what you don't have to pay back. So this is also offered through the FAFSA. This is also offered um, outside of the, the university, which would be things like um, 
Sometimes people's jobs offer scholarships. Sometimes organizations, churches offer scholarships. All of that can be used to help pay your bill. Um, I put down here at the bullet point at the bottom is you must stay eligible for financial aid. And why I put that in there is, is financial aid is based also off you passing your classes. So if you come to school, get your financial aid, fail all your classes, there's a chance you can lose your financial aid and have to appeal for it to get back. I don't want that to be a shock once it comes in. I understand that you do have to pass your classes and stay on a good track of graduation to keep this financial aid. Next slide, please. Um, question you, you're going to have to have uh, with your parent or guardian or whomever is helping you, you go to college or pay for college is, is how are you going to pay this balance? Um, there is a price estimator here at UNCG that you can use to kind of estimate what it's going to cost and you can go through and change the different statuses, meaning tuition and fees, you can't, you can't change those. Tuition and fees are going to stay the same for everybody. Um, if you take three hours, it's one cost. If you take six hours, it's one cost. If you take 12 or more hours, there's a separate cost for that. The more hours you take, the more expensive it's going to be. But what you can control is your housing, whether you're living on campus or off campus or with a parent. You can control your meal plan, which is, are you going to eat meals on campus? Um, and you can also control your textbooks. You don't have to buy the most expensive textbooks. And if you speak to most students who have attended college before, they have some secrets on how to get textbooks a little bit cheaper and buy them used. But you have to pay the difference out of pocket. And most schools have a payment plan, meaning your financial aid comes in, pays most of your bill, you have a little bit left over. Let's say you have a thousand, two thousand left over. You can set a payment plan up with the cashier's office at most universities and make payments at those. So you don't have to take out a loan. You don't have to, parents don't have to take out a loan to pay that sum up front. You can make payments on that. Highly recommend it because it's no interest attached to it. That's a better way to pay for school. Um, because you are juniors and seniors coming in and starting next August, you're gonna to have to have this conversation with your parents or guardians. I know it's not the fun conversation to have, um, but you're gonna to have to decide now how you're gonna pay for school in August of 2021. The bill's gonna come, there's gonna be a deadline for it. You wanna start, saving, you want to start formulating a plan now to make those payments. You don't want to wait till August and now you have to make a bill or a payment that's two or $3,000. I doubt most of us could come out of pocket two or $3,000 next month if we had to, but if you gave us six months, if you gave us a year, we definitely could. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it for me. I do want to say that early bird gets the worm. So make sure you do things early. Make sure you communicate with all the offices. All of our offices have somebody that you can talk to. You have experts year round in these offices to ask for advice. Use them. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Dr. Ratliff. I, we appreciate the information that is very helpful. And you are right, you know, they, you can make payment plans and the um, uh, cashier's office will make that arrangement with you. So it may look like that for you um, for a student needs to make a payment plan and that is absolutely fine um, and you have time. So um, great information here. Um, we, I do wanna mention that we will get to your questions. We are um, going to answer these questions towards the end. I see them coming in. Um, I, I do want you to know that we are not ignoring, ignoring them. So uh, be patient, maybe along the way you'll get some answers um, I see a couple of things um, that are popping up that uh, may be answered along the way as our presentation continues. So um, be patient with us. And uh, Katia, Margarita, take it away. Hello again. Um, my name is Katia Castellón, as I said before, and I'm an associate director at Undergraduate Missions. And uh, I have been working with UNCG for 15 years, you know, and pretty much with the uh, Latinx Hispanic community my whole life. Um, uh, originally from Nicaragua. And uh, I want to share a little bit about DACA and undocumented students. And I know that, um, you know, our DACA and undocumented students, they have a lot of obstacles. They have a lot of limitations. You know, sometimes it's a, it's a very 
hard road, you know, to get to graduate from a higher education institution. And a lot of our students, you know, uh, they get discouraged and they give up. And I'm always encouraging that kind of undocumented students do not give up, you know, ask, seek for help, you know, do not give up your dreams. Um, even though, as I said, there is limited resources and a lot of obstacles, there are also some opportunities. And that's uh, what I wanna talk to you about. I wanna share those opportunities so you can take advantage of them. On my next slide, you know, we're gonna uh, be talking about those things that you can do uh, to get ahead. Uh, one of the things that I always recommend, you know, high school students is uh, to start earning college credits while they're still in high school. Um, the reason is because uh, when you're in high school and uh, you earn credits through an AP courses or early or middle college, you know, you're earning those college credits and they're free of charge. So you don't have to pay for those credits that you're earning. So if uh, you're still on ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, you know, or even if you're going to start your senior year, you know, do your best to see if, if you can get some college credits under your belt. You know, uh, a lot of our DACA and undocumented students, um, they apply to early college because it's, it, um, it gives them the opportunity to finish their high school with an associate's degree. You know, so that saves them two years of uh, money and two years of time. And um, the other opportunity that I want to share with you, I don't know if all of, the, all of you are aware, but DACA students, not undocumented, this would not apply for undocumented students because it requires, you know, for the student to have a social security and to have a job. But if you have an employer who is willing to sponsor you as a student, you know, and uh, there is some type of paperwork, you know, sometimes a letter that they have to send to the community college, uh, this only applies to community college and it is the business sponsorship. So if your employer agrees to help you, you know, and sponsor you, um, what it means is that your employer is going to pay your bill from the community college. And even though you as a DACA student, um, you're considered as an out of state, the employer who is a business established in North Carolina, the business is considered in-state. So they will be billing your employer as an in-state. Now, when we talk about business sponsorship, you know, we're not talking about huge businesses or corporations. You know, we, we know that a lot of our DACA students, their parents, they have their own business, you know, landscaping, construction, you know, any type of business that is um, registered in the uh, state of North Carolina, it is considered a resident. So even though the parents might be undocumented, if they have a registered business, the business itself is considered a resident of North Carolina. So your parents' business or your uncle's business or your friend's business can sponsor you uh, to pay your tuition at the community college and they will be uh, build as in-state. So that's an opportunity that I always encourage our DACA student to take advantage of. It's a benefit that the uh, state of North Carolina provide to the businesses to help their employees. Now, there's no requirement as far as how many hours the student has to work. You know, the student can work as little as four hours a week. You know, the community colleges, they don't care as long as you can prove that you are employed, that you are in the payroll, you know, and uh, you have a job and that business is paying for your tuition. Uh, also, there's a lot of scholarships, you know, that are uh, exclusively for DACA and undocumented students. You know, it's a matter of searching. And sometimes it might become a full-time job for you to find that scholarship. And I always recommend that the student starts early, you know, not the last minute, because usually a lot of our students come to us maybe a month or two, you know, when they get the bill from the university or the community college and they said, I don't know how to pay for it, you know, is there a scholarship? And by the time, you know, they try to apply, all the scholarships have been already uh, given out and the deadline has passed. So if you're considering attending um, 
higher education, you know, community college, you know, uh, for your university, if you're uh, planning or applying to UNCG, uh, start start doing your applications to the scholarship as soon as possible, you know, start doing it like in this month or next month, you know, because the deadlines varies. And uh, if you need help with those lists, you know, send us an email and I'll be happy to provide you with a list of scholarships that you might apply to. As I said, that are exclusively for DACA and undocumented students. Now, there is a, a, a tuition plan that has been um, established by some of our sisters uh, universities, you know, like UNC Pembroke, Western Carolina University, and Elizabeth City State University. And uh, what they have implemented, or the state has implemented through these three universities, is a plan that is called NC Promise Tuition Plan. And what it is, is it's a flat fee for in-state or for out-of-state uh, students. So if you're a DACA student, and if you're an undocumented student, you know, you will be considered out-of-state. But under this NC North Carolina Promise Tuition Plan, the out-of-state tuition will be a flat fee of $2,500. So, um, and some of the programs, you can finish them online. So let's say you start uh, an associate's degree at the local community college, you know, under business sponsorship, and you can attend two years. And then the other two years, you can go to any of those three institutions, you know, and um, apply for the NC Promise tuition plan. So your out-of-state tuition will be 2500 which is actually less than any in-state tuition rate at any other public university. So that is a good opportunity. Uh, the only downside is that uh, I would say the programs are very limited in a way that if you're not planning on, uh, uh, planning on living in campus, then you're going to have to look for a program that they offer online. Because if you live in campus, of course, the costs are going to uh, are going to be higher because you're going to have to pay for your dorm and your meals, you know, on your insurance plan. So, you know, if you really want to save on the cost, I would recommend going to community college first and then, you know, apply for any of the programs they have or also, you know, go to community college and that will give you a two year window hopefully to see if at some point North Carolina approves the in-state tuition for our DACA and undocumented students. Another thing that I want to share is that um, some visas like the U visa, TPS, you know, refugee asylee status, those are considered in-state for tuition purposes. You know, so if you have any of those visa types, you know, you can be considered in-state either at a community college or at a four-year um, uh, university. Um, now for community colleges, you know, if you are, if you have a pending residency petition, and this is really important because a lot of our families, you know, they have a relative, you know, a brother or a sister, parents, you know, uh, specifically brothers and sisters, you know, siblings that have applied or have petitioned your parents, you know, and um, there is a pending residency. And we know that those petitions are, are taken sometimes depending on the country, like if the country is uh, Mexico, you know, those petitions might take up to 20 years, you know, uh, for it, for you to get a, a green card. But um, the thing, and this is something that, that not a lot of people knows or are aware of, and is that if you have a pending residency, if, uh, you know, one of your parents' siblings have petitioned them for a green card and they're just waiting and waiting, years of waiting, while they're waiting, and even though they do not have an immigration status, you know, if there is a, a I-130 or an I-140, receipt notice, which means that they have just filed a petition and immigration has received the petition. It might not be approved, but they just received it. You know, then you will be considered in-state in a community college. Um, if you have the petition received and approved and you have the I-485 receipt notice, 
then you will be considered in state at a four year institution as well. Or if you only have the I-485 approval notice, which is the last stage of the petition of the green card, then you will also be considered, you know, as an in-state at a four-year community, uh, four-year institution as well as a community college. But um, the bottom line is, please, please do not give up. I know it is hard. I know there's a lot of obstacles, you know, but. Uh, there are options, even if there are limited resources, you have to keep fighting for your dreams, you know, ask, seek help, you know, and uh, just take every opportunity that you can get to advance in your higher education. And if you need any help, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us, that we're here to help you. Uh, you know, we do want our community, we do want our Latinx and our Hispanic students, you know, to succeed, to achieve their dreams, to pursue that degree that they're dreaming of. So we're here to help you in any way we can. And um, by saying that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it off to Margarita, and she's going to be uh, sharing with you some tips about RDS and about FAFSA. Okay. Um, about RDS, um, let me, um, residency determination is an application, okay? When you apply to college, you will need to um, fill this application. Uh, the application is the residency determination, okay? And this application um, is um, just to, um, to determine um, that you live in North Carolina for the purposes that you pay in-state tuition. Um, it, it's similar to FAFSA application. Some of the uh, questions that you will um, uh, answer for FAFSA, that's the same kind of question that you will um, answer for the residency determination. Most of the, um, of the students do not have all the detailed family information uh, when they fill the application. That's why we as a admission counselors in the residency determination services too, re, uh, we recommend completing, completing the um, online application with parent or legal guardian. Um, again, because the student don't have all the detailed family information, for example, that they, when their parents arrive to live in North Carolina or the month and year uh, in which the parents married. And a lot of other questions that the student, if they don't have the information, you, you as a student, will close the application and you will never try to finish. That is uh, a mistake. Ask for, for help and finish. This application is very, very important. And remember the goal, uh, the goal of the application is, not, is to identify acts we demonstrate in North Carolina is the true home of, of you and your parents or your family. Um, and because each family situation is different, the, the, the application uh, will ask different information about each student. Now, North Carolina residency refer to the length uh, of time living in North Carolina and not an immigration status. The question in the application um, says, uh, what's the date of the parent um, or when your parent came to, to live in, uh, no, what's the, I'm sorry, what's the day of parents in North Carolina residency, something like that. And don't be confused. Um, uh, most of the time the student mistake it for the US resident status uh, and sometimes close the application and never finish it. Um, and also you will see uh, one question 
that's um, it's about the parent's uh, social security number. When the parent um, doesn't have a social security number, um, the student can use the parent uh, I team. That is the individual taxpayer information number. Um, and if the student enter the parent's IT number, the system will allow uh, the student to proceed without problems during the rest of the process. And then again, the student need to be with the parents or the guardian and having all the information the student need. Um, the student must not, please, not write their parents' IT number in the space that is assigned for the social security number. The IT number has another space uh, assign, uh, assigned for that. Um, when the student just choose the option that say, say says, sorry, your parent legal guardian does not have a social security or will need to provide a different identification number. You click that and you can uh, see the IT uh, individual tax uh, pay identification um, uh, um, space for that, okay? And what is, uh, oh, about DACA, DACA and undocumented student are not considered North Carolina resident for tuition purposes for now. And when, but you need to fill the residency determination application, just select no to the first question that says, do you claim residency? Just answer no. And the application assign you the, assign the student uh, a residency certification number and the student can complete college admission application when they decide to go, okay? Um, don't try to fill all the application. Um, but like Katia says, uh, non-US citizen with certain visa and immigration statuses um, are eligible for in-state tuition and state financial aid. Um, call RDS local number always um, and you can ask or, or send us an email if you have questions. That's it for me. Thank you, Margarita. Those were very helpful tips and information. Um, in conclusion, I think that with your piece, um, ask questions. Do not leave a, a pending question to the air. Always seek for someone to you know, answer these questions for you. Experts, call them. So in our last session, we talked about how you know, our alumni and our students created this family at UNCG because of these two ladies, Margarita and Katia, they were mentioned a lot in our conversation. They have created a community with our students that is so tight knit. Um, they go to them for all of their questions. And if they don't know, be sure that they will and they will go and find the question uh, or the answer for you. Um, so they are very well connected with our campus partners and um, are always willing to extend that hand, whether you are a UNCG student or whether you are you know, a community college student that is wanting to attend or just you know, someone who is interested in, in attending college, they are very helpful. So I can't even express how much um, value they are to our campus. Um, they're a big part of our familia. So thank you. Um, again, no question is dumb. Reach out to anyone that is able to answer these questions and please reach out to Katia or Margarita who um, may be able to answer them. Pema, you're going to tell us about these, uh, the senior guidance. Um, what is this? Yeah, hey everyone. So like I mentioned before, my name is Hema Herrera. Um, so I'll just be going over briefly on kind of the suggested timeline that would be ideal for 
your senior year. Um, so I'll touch base on a few of those. But again, if you do have any specific questions, feel free to drop those in and we will answer them accordingly. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So perfect. Um, so as we're moving into, we're already in August, which is crazy because it feels like March was like yesterday. Um, so uh, between August and September, I would say definitely trying to create like your last like final list of the schools that you're wanting to apply um, would be ideal. So let's say if you have um, your top five, if you have your top eight, Depending on how you want to navigate that, if you want to apply to a lot of schools, you're more than welcome to do so. But ideally, um, having a good solid list is going to be helpful for you because there are many materials um, needed for your application. So um, some of those will be your letters of recommendations, your transcript, transcript, sorry, um, fee waivers if you need to ask for them, and then also just making sure that you're able to see what deadlines you need to take note of. So a good thing would be if you have that list already, go ahead and mark it in your calendar and your planner, anything of that nature. That way um, you can keep track of those deadlines because they are definitely very important. Um, for September and until um, you can go ahead and start applying, you can even feel free to start applying earlier on. I know certain schools do give kind of like their essay prompts or things of that nature um, already. And so you can go ahead and get started on that as well. But ideally, um, around this time is when you see students applying to their um, school of choice. So during this time, things that you should take note of are like the application deadlines and also seeing if there's early action versus early decision, depending on which schools you're applying to. So reminder on that early action is non binding and early decision is binding. Um, so that's just the distinction there. Um, the other thing that uh, Margarita touched base on was completing your RDS application. So for any application, they are gonna ask you for your RCN, which is your RDS number. So once you complete the application itself, you will have access to that number. And on most applications, they will tell you to put in that number, regardless if it classifies you as in-state in -state student or out of state, it is needed. And if for some reason the application lets you submit it and you miss um, adding that information in there, what you would have to do is just contact admissions and let them know um, that you have that number available. That way they can update your um, status. That is very important to do so. Um, the next um, piece would be just requesting um, any type of fee waivers that you may feel that are needed. And if you are eligible for those, um, you can ask for them. So the way that you could do that is through your counselor, counselors, I'm sorry, or also through your um, college advisor if your school has one. So that's where you can request for those. Um, the last kind of big part I would say is just requesting your letters of recommendation. So taking note of what schools are asking for you in those letters of recommendation. Is it a personal one? Is it a professional one? Um, is it a teacher recommendation? And so forth. And so with thinking of letters of recommendation in general, it would be ideal for you to just ask in advance um, just for courtesy. And so the ideal time frame for that would probably be like two and a half weeks to three weeks. I know um, students have asked a little bit later than that and teachers are still able to do them, um, but the more time the better. And so then when we are moving forward into October, we would just really want to make sure that you're reviewing and submitting all of your required materials for your application. Um, so like I mentioned before, this can include your transcript. So this can include high school and also the community college that you're um, dually enrolled at if that applies to you. Um, the application fees, your test scores, letters of recommendation, um, your essay revisions or edits, anything of that nature, just trying to make sure that that's all squared away. Um, so I did put until, like as far as the time frame, because I understand that not everyone is going to apply around the same time. Some people need a little bit more time and or um, some applications, their deadlines aren't necessarily until the spring. It just varies by institution. So keep that in mind as well. 
Um, I did want to make note that all of these items should be submitted prior to the application deadline, because I know, for example, like myself, like when I was in the application process, um, they happened to miss one thing and it set me back from early action decision to regular decision. Um, so it pushed me back so many months. And so it was just one minor thing that just slipped through the cracks. And so just um, be aware of that because institutions are um, do stick to those deadlines. And the last thing too is during October, um, there is an emphasis on college application month and a few of you may or may not have heard of that. And so this does take place in October. This does not mean that you're not able to apply before or after, um, but during that month in October, certain schools are waived as far as their fees and their specific dates for that. And where you can find access to that would be on the cfnc.org um, page and you'll be able to see the list of those um, schools that are participating for this upcoming year. So the next part too would be applying for financial aid and so we touched base on this already and um, like we mentioned before it opens up October 1st. And it is something that is to be completed each year. So each year that you're in school, if you are um, needing and wanting financial aid assistance, this would be application that you do need to submit. And I know we also touched base on the whole application itself too. So I'm not gonna go too into it, but um, one of the big parts of it is creating an FSA ID and that is for the parent and the student. Um, so a social security number is needed and if you're kind of wondering what, um, what that looks like, depending on your documentation status, whether for you or your parent, um, there is a link in this presentation as well that we can um, send for y'all in order for y'all to kind of look over that. Um, priority deadlines do vary by institution. So kind of what Dr. Radliff, Ratliff said, um, the earlier the better. So just keep that in mind. And I know, for example, UNCG's, um, it's in the first week in December, so the sooner you get it in, the better. And again, if you need any assistance with that, your guidance counselor or your college advisor, if you have one, can help you with that as well. Or also feel free to just contact um, financial aid as well if you have a specific question. Um, and so moving forward for November into the spring, what you would want to continue doing is um, finishing your FAFSA if you haven't done so already submitting any remaining applications by their deadlines. And then from there, one big thing is also scholarship opportunities, just researching and seeing if there are any that you're able to apply for and so forth. Um, one big question that I used to get was, when do local scholarships become available? And so if your school has a specific one, typically those tend to open around December, January, but the deadline is pretty quick on the turnaround for that. Um, so given that we have COVID um, right now, th that may look a little bit different, but as of my knowledge, that's kind of um, where that has remained true. And so this is just translated uh, key terminology. So if you just want to, uh, if you're wanting to share this with your parent, if your parent is watching, watching this, these are some, um, just some words that we touched base and I wanted to translate that or how we wanted to have that translated for you so y'all could um, be aware of what that meant. So the first one was just NCRDS or La Aplicación de Residencia del Estado, so for the state. Um, FASFA is just La Aplicación de Ayuda Financiera. The FSA ID would be El Nombre de Usario y Contraseña del, del Estudiante y, y Padre. So again, if that applies to you, um, scholarships, just becas. And, and again, scholarships, if you're trying to describe that to your parents, becas, you do not pay back. Um, and then counselor, just consejero, consejera de la escuela. And so we have additional resources, as I mentioned before. So I know we've touched base a little bit on this already, but some college application websites or sitios um, is cfnc.org. And this is where you're able to apply um, to certain schools and that same username and password is the same one that you will use to complete your residency application. So do take note of that. The other um, website would be commonapp.org. And again, some of these will actually refer you specifically to the school if they have a personal application. So do keep that in mind, um, but also know that it's completely normal if it redirects you to a different um, site. 
Um, we have the FAFSA website or um, sitio, so fafsa.ed.gov. And again, to Dr. Ratliff's point, FAFSA is free. So um, be very, very careful on the website that you end up selecting. It, you will never be asked to pay to complete this application. The next one would be your FSA ID website slash sitio. Um, and that is just fsaid.ed.gov. This is to be only created once if you're able to do so. Um, so the first time that you complete it and you have your username and your password for that, go ahead and jot that down because you're gonna be needing it for the next um, upcoming year. And if you wanna keep track of your parents or vice versa, it's great to do so because if not um, the process of it, you will have to either answer security questions to get it to get access to it again, or you will have to actually call for assistance. Um, some other additional resources um, that I included on here were just um, scholarship websites through CFNC. We have so much potential.org, which is DACA and undocu undocu friendly colleague planning resource website. We have fastweb.com, which is also another scholarship um, uh, website. Then we also have student aid gov um, and so forth and that is actually the pdf that i was mentioning where you can see the distinction of where um, you stand as far as your documentation status and what that looks like when applying for fafsa um, and then i added uh, the uncg also grants and scholarships web website if you're interested in that we added the RDS um, application website as well. And then also the local number at the bottom as well. And um, this will still remain accessible to y'all and it'll remain on, I'm pretty sure on our page too. So you'll be able to access this as well if you're not able to, um, yeah, if you're not able to access that right now. But I think that's all I have. I'm not sure I haven't looked to see if there's any questions specifically but I think that's all for me. Thank you, Hema. This is very helpful information. So seniors, if you would like to have access to something to this presentation, email us, contact us, and we are happy to share this with you um, and send it your way. So there are several questions in our chat from our audience. And one of our first questions was, um, when is the best time to apply? I am interested to, uh, in applying or taking early action, but I'm taking the SAT at the end of the month. So do I wait until I get the score or apply as soon as possible? Um, yeah, so it's up to you when you would like to apply. December 1st is our early action deadline. Um, so for example, if you wanted to take the SAT at the end of the month, um, keep in mind, if you were to submit your application now, and if, say, you completed it, had everything in, that would turn that into review status. So we would be able to make a decision off of that. So if you wanted to send your test scores in, I would say you probably would want to wait until you take the test. That way you can add your test scores to your application. And when we review your completed application, it will have those test scores on it. Um, so just keep that in mind. If it's complete, then it will go into review status. I just want to add, um, just to keep in mind that for this coming year, you know, for spring 2021 uh, and uh, fall 2021, test scores are not required. They're optional. So if you send them and uh, they're low, they will not hinder your application. But if you got good test scores, you know, they will be taken in consideration in your favor. So, you know, but it is not necessary for you to send the test scores, you know, in order to complete your application and, um, you know, be admissible. And our current motto in the admissions office is that they can help you, but they won't hurt you. Thank you, Katia. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, how is UNCG taking test scores? You guys answer that. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have probably read this beforehand, but um, so I think we answered this question for her with, with your last comment. Thank you, Katia. Um, Diana is asking, um, can a green card holder apply for a FAFSA? 
Absolutely. Uh, the FAFSA is going to ask your citizenship status and you would put uh, eligible non-citizen and then it's going to ask for your A number that's listed there on your green card and you put that information in there. So yes, you're, you are a eligible for federal financial aid. Um, one of our audience members asked about a, um, how long does an appeal take? Um, I'm not really sure if you were able to give us uh, the type of appeal that you were referring to. Um, that question is to our audience. Um, the appeal that I mentioned in my comments was for a satisfactory academic progress appeal. So let's say you have a really tough semester or two semesters and don't pass all of your classes. You do have to appeal to get your financial aid back. Um, if you have a really good excuse, I got mono, I got really sick, I broke my leg, so I had to sit out of classes, that's an easy appeal because it's easily documented and shown. Um, if you just said, you know what, uh, I had too much fun and didn't pass my classes, well, then that may be a little bit longer appeal to get done. But you can appeal to get it back. It just may take up to one semester for that appeal to go through. Thank you. Um... So there was a talk about financial aid being taken away if you fell too many classes. Is that correct? Yep, that is true. You are, financial aid is locked in at a certain amount of hours and you have to pass 67% of those locked hours. If you fail those classes or withdraw from those classes, there's potentially you can lose your financial aid. Um, so before you ever start getting in trouble and failing a class or before you ever decide to drop a class, I would communicate with the student's first office and I'd also communicate with the financial aid office. Thank you, Chris. Um, a person who's acquired uh, a green card but is a North Carolina resident is considered as an in-state or out-of-state? Um, it will be required for the person to have uh, the green card for a year to be considered in state. So you need to take a look and see when the green card was issued. And um, 12 months after that, that's when you will be considered as a resident of North Carolina for uh, tuition purposes. Thank you, Katia. Um, our next questions, what about asylum seekers? Are they eligible for in-state tuition? Um, you be um, going back to the uh, previous question too. Oh, you know, sure. I have to mention that uh, sometimes we have students that are acquiring or acquire their permanent residency card because they had a previous status like a refugee or asylee status, or sometimes they have had a U visa, you know, and they're transitioning from that visa or that immigration status into a green card. So if that is the case, you know, then their previous status, like uh, some type of visas, um, are still el eligible, you know, or are still considered for in-state tuition. So, which means that if the previous visa they had, you know, uh, before they got their residency card, if that previous status was eligible for in-state, then they don't have that waiting period of 12 months, you know, for their green card, um, for them to be eligible for in-state. They will continue having, you know, the in-state eligibility because we will take in consideration, RDS will take in consideration that the previous status was eligible for in-state and now they have their card, their green card. So they will still be considered as in-state. Now for asylum, you know, asylee and the refugee seekers, um, it all depends you know, at what stage. Uh, for four years institution, you know, it is required that they have their status approved. You know, nowadays there are so many petitions that uh, there's a backload. So uh, it is a little bit different than before. Before, you know, a couple of years ago when the refugee or asylee used to file their petition, you know, they would get that status uh, pretty much right away. You know, nowadays, since there's so many applications, you know, and uh, there's so many restrictions and limitations. So there is that waiting period, you know, for their application to be approved. And while they're waiting, you know, if the application has not been approved, it has been our experience that uh, in a four-year institution, they will not be considered as in-state, but they might in community colleges. You know, it all depends how community college will, you know, uh, see their um, 
petition. Sometimes, as I said, the green card pending applications are considered in-state at community college. So um, I don't know if community college are also considering them as in-state. And Margarita, you have a little bit more experience in that respect, you know, because you have been talking to students that are asylum seekers. And uh, I know that when they try to come to UNCG, you know, they're classified as out of state, but I don't know if that's the same case at a community college. What has your experience been, Margarita, in that respect? Yeah, it's the same thing in community college. Okay. They ask for the the, the approval. The approval. Okay. Later. <laughs> okay. So is this just for the residents for the I-130 and the I-140 pending applications that are the uh, exception? Okay. So I guess it will be out of state if you know until uh, the petition has been actually approved. Thank you, ladies. So if in doubt, reach out. If you have questions regarding the type of visa that you have, um, reach out to us. Um, Margarita and Katia would be able to answer these questions for you. Um, if you have any you know, questions as to the v type of visa that you have um, or any other of the RDS questions. Um, our next question uh, was about our slides. Will they be available? Um, yes, they will be available. If you uh, would like to have a copy of this presentation, please email us, um, or I'm sorry, type in your email and we would be happy to share that uh, presentation with you. Let's see, and our question here, if, uh, if the child lives with her mother and her stepfather, does the stepfather ha uh, have to submit a FAFSA as well or just mom? Ooh. That was a big thunder. FAFSA looks at the biological parent and spouse information. So all of that means is the FAFSA says, is your parent married or not married? They're going to say, yes, they're married, and they're going to include both the mother and stepfather's information on the FAFSA. Um, that's not a UNCG rule. That's just the way the federal policies are written. So yes, you would include the stepfather and any children in the household on the FAFSA, and you would include their combined income for 2019 on the upcoming FAFSA. So yes, do include your step parent. A lot of times what happens with parents is, they, you know, it's not their child, so he's not gonna help pay for school. You complete your FAFSA and put that you're married or unmarried, and then you do your tax um, status as married or unmarried. And if those don't match, your FAFSA is most likely gonna be selected for verification where you're gonna to have to turn this information into the school, the tax information, the household information, which will, will delay your, your, your FAFSA and your financial aid for about two to three weeks. All right, our final question here is, do I do RDS? Uh, before applying for uh, to the school? Emma, you are the specialist. Yeah, um, for ideally, yes, but there has been cases where some, some schools do accept the application without the RDS number. So if you already completed the application and you forgot to add it on there, or if you actually completed the application later, then what you can do is just call admissions typically and you're able to update that number in there. But if you fail to do so, if I'm not mistaken and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're still classified, I think as of out of state, I don't know if that's true or not, but essentially you would want to have that number in there um, just because if you're an in-state student, you would really wanna make sure. Um, but regardless, everyone has to have that on there. Um, so to the question, yes and no, depends on the institution. When in doubt, just call and have that information submitted. But uh, Katia says, uh, I'm sorry, Katia, the best time to apply, I will read your uh, answer, Katia. The best time to apply is um, as early as possible. Uh, for UNCG, uh, it will be better to apply and be admitted by December 1st to be considered for Merit scholarship. Uh, RDS is done uh, as part of the admission application. Once you get your uh, residency certification number uh, from the application, you enter this number every time you apply for admission, admissions in any college or community college. Okay. 
-hmm. And also, um, it has been our experience that, um, you know, some of our students, um, they're classified out of state and they just leave it like that. And uh, it does not necessarily mean that they will be out of state. Sometimes if RDS consider that they need additional documents or they have other questions for the student, you know, the system will automatically classify them as out of state. But if the student believes, remember that um, the, the residency is for, you know, the family, the time they have been in North Carolina, not necessarily the immigration status of the parents. So if the student is a permanent resident, you know, if it's a US citizen, regardless of the immigration status of the uh, family, you know, they would more likely be eligible for in-state tuition. So sometimes um, the system will automatically classify them as out of state, you know, but if you believe that you're in state, then, you know, make sure that you appeal, you know, that decision and, uh, you know, you can submit additional documents that will prove that, you know, you are eligible for in-state and that, you know, your family has been living in North Carolina for longer than 12 months. So don't be afraid, you know, to appeal, to um, do a reconsideration, to pick up the phone and call RDS and always ask, you know, why am I being classified out of state? You know, and they will tell you, you know, they are pretty friendly. We have learned that, you know, um, RDS uh, office and the people that works for the RDS, you know, they're trying to help the student, you know, and um, just when you're classified out of state, you know, don't just take the answer, always ask why. So you'll have a clear reason why you're being classified out of a state. And if that reason is wrong, then you can go ahead and submit, you know, the documentation that will prove that you are indeed a, a North Carolina resident. Yes. One thing, another thing I want to ask, you know, that I did not mention, and this goes to all our students, you know, Margarita and, and I were always encouraging the students, you know, to um, just not just pick one major, but double major, and if possible, triple major, okay, because it costs the same. So you can get, you know, double major, you can study, you know, uh, different um topics, you know, different fields, and it's going to cost the same. You know, at UNCG, if you take more than, you know, four classes or, or more, it costs the same, you know, so you take four courses, you're a full-time student, you take, you know, five, you know, any, any credit hours between 12 and 18, it costs the same. So we're always encouraging our student to take advantage, you know, of those things that will help them, um, you know, get the most out of the institution. Thank you, Katia. Thank you, Margarita. Um, as they mentioned before, this is our conclusion would be prepare, plan ahead, ask those questions by reaching out, connect with those people that are experts. Um, DACA, undocumented students, don't give up. There are loops out there. Just, you know, ask, ask questions. Um, I can't express that like, but so much, um, there are ways to get around. Um, so just don't give up. Um, and as Dr. Ratliff had mentioned, um, the early bird eats the worm. So be prepared, apply early. Any other questions or any other comments from our panelists that you have? Very rarely you have this many experts on the screen to ask questions, so. That's true, that's true. Well, I thank you guys so much for your time um, and for sticking with us. Um, our panelists, thank you. Our audience, thank you. Um, we hope that, you know, this may have eased some of your questions. Um, if there are more concerns, reach out. We are happy to help and um, answer these uh, for you. We will have our contact information. Um, you can find it on our UNCG Chance page. Um, and if you are wanting this information, please message us your email and we would be happy to um, send you this presentation. Thank you again. Buenas noches. <laughs>